From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number two, recorded on November 4th, 2019. <laughs> I'm Vincent Dracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today here in the Microbe TV studios in New York City, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. I'm glad you came for number two, so you liked it enough. (laughs) (laughs) I guess I'm here. (laughs) Also joining us here in studio, he is from Columbia University, Ecology Evolution and Environmental Biology, and the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. Andres Bendeski, welcome. Hi, Vincent. Happy to be here. Good. Not too much of a trip for you, right? No, nope, just a shuttle, 20 minutes. So the subway's not working, right? No, I took the inter-school shuttle. Right. Very convenient, yeah. So the the number one, which you would take, yeah. is not working until like it's next year. It's like a year. whole year, yeah. Yeah, right. And from Salt Lake City, Utah, Jason Shepard. Hey there. Welcome back. Glad to be back. I should say that here in New York City, it is just partly sunny, partly cloudy. I don't know, whatever you want to call it, depending on whether your glass is half full or half empty. Sunny, 13 Celsius. We are in fall mode. I spent yesterday cleaning leaves from my backyard, which I really dislike. (laughs) Uh, I, I don't know. understand why trees have to drop their leaves. I guess there's not enough huh. sun in the winter. <laughs> they should. And the thing is, nobody, no animal eats the leaves. Yep. Right? Well, I guess the microbes in the soil. Yeah, like the microbes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We need a microbiologist. No yeah. animals, <laughs> but they're not animals, of course. Well. But yes, so I blow my leaves into the woods and they decompose. They make great dirt. Yeah, they but, but it takes a year right. to do that. Um, Jason, do you have a backyard? I do, and uh, yeah, I actually do. I have a pine tree and a non-pine tree, and the the non-pine tree makes a huge mess. Yep, it um, does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I still like the the changing of the seasons because I grew up in South Africa where uh, we never got to see hmm. fall or winter, and so even now it's still novel for me. I still like it. I used to like it, but <laughs> I'm liking it less. I'd rather it just stayed warm and the leaves stayed on the trees, but it's not up to me. It just is, seems like a huge waste of biomass. But as you guys said, yeah, it is degraded to make. And that's most of the dirt in the woods is leaves. So I guess that's good. We have a lot of deer uh, around us as well. And we have a new entry into our neighborhood, coyotes. Hmm. Cool. Mm. So there apparently is this hybrid of a coyote and a wolf that's populating the Northeast. Mm-hmm. You know about this, Andres? Yeah, I think they've been expanding from the West and mixing us with wolves, yeah. And apparently they're urban adapted. They like to live Mm. among people and they take advantage of stuff associated with us. And um, so we have a lot of roadkill and they eat it. Is it climate change associated, like the move East? I don't know. know. It's a good question. But they definitely are hybrid with with wolves, coyotes and wolves, and they're different. I, I was in St. Louis a couple weeks ago, and the biggest roadkill there is armadillos, which have uh-huh. moved north f- because of climate change. There are jokes about that, you know. Armadillos are too dumb to cross the street or something. Uh-huh. I forgot what it is. Someone it's, told me not once. A chicken. Oh, I was in Galveston, and there are lots of armadillos there. Yeah, armadillo joke. I'll look it up while you guys are talking. <laughs> uh, if you like what we do on, on all of our podcasts, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Yeah, but guys, by the way, at the end of the show, we got two emails already. Oh, oh, nice. oh wow. Isn't that cool? Fun mail. And uh, yeah, questions, comments. Yeah, we get lots of those on the podcast and we read them as mm-hmm. part of it, which is mm-hmm. cool. So Andres, uh, tell us a little bit, since this is your first twin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Sure. Yeah, I'm from Mexico City. I grew up there. I went to college. I went to a combined med school college program seven years uh, right after high school and so you're a doctor i'm a doctor yeah <laughs> but don't ask me to see patients because they may not survive <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> so then i decided to do a phd i came here to new york to rockefeller uh, university i did my phd with c elegance studying uh, genetics and neuroscience of behavior 
and then I moved to Harvard to do a postdoc uh, on similar topic, but using wild mice, uh, deer mice. That wasn't Ho Hopi Hoekstra, was it? Yep, with uh, Hopi yeah, Hoekstra. Mice is Hopi, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she's been on one of our podcasts. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, so I was there for a couple of years before coming back here two years ago to Columbia. Uh, we did her paper with, the what is it, a 13-striped? Oh, yeah. That's, that's a right. guy who yeah. dissected and did transcriptomics to sure. figure out. Yeah, that's my friend, Ricardo. Oh. Yeah. And she said that she didn't think it would work, and <laughs> she let him do it, and <laughs> she was amazed. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful results. Single gene that differs in expression between the black stripes and the white stripes, and right. new ALX3 transcription factor, yeah. At Rock, who did you work with? Uh, Corey Bargman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, so you've jumped around there with, uh, with different species, huh? Yep. Now, yeah, and now here we're still studying the deer mice, paramiscus, and we've added Siamese fighting fish to study their oh, wow. aggression. So, so I know paramiscus maniculatus because right. it's a hantavirus yeah. host. Yeah. So you don't catch them, right? You breed them, I guess. I have caught them. I, I went with um, Hopi's lab to Nebraska to mm -hmm. for a project we were doing there, or I was helping. Um, Rowan Barrett mainly do this study in the wild, transferring mice from the sand hills into and out of the sand hills where right. there's a, a dark soil and light soil. So I was doing a little bit of mm -hmm. field work there. Um, and then I've caught a few mice here upstate at Black Rock Forest, but mm -hmm. the lab we, uh, the mice we use in our lab are mostly, uh, lab bred. Method, They're not, yeah. yeah, we don't catch all our mice. Yeah, because 30% of wild paramiscus are, are virus positive. Yep. And so you have to yeah, really be, be careful. careful. I went to visit a guy in, in Vermont who studies them in his lab, and he he wants them in the natural environment. Mm -hmm. So this is great. He sinks 55-gallon drums into the ground outside, mm -hmm. and he puts the mice in the bottom. So they can't get out, but they're outside. Mm -hmm. And then he, you know, I don't know what he, he looks at transmission or whatever, yeah. but isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's very so cool. Who digs the holes? He says, I do. <laughs> and he took a big, you, see, you could see many different 55 gallon drums. I guess you have to fence it off so you don't accidentally fall into it. They're also a very important reservoir for Lyme disease, mm -hmm. part of their transmission. Oh. So they're useful for that type of research. Yeah. It's pretty unusual to study paramiscus in the lab, right? It's not very common, yeah. Uh, especially their behavior, neurobiology. There's a few labs in California, mm -hmm. Hoppy's lab, and now my lab, but. It's not very common. We don't have as uh, sophisticated yeah. tools as with lab mice. Yeah. Are they difficult to breed? So some species, the promiscuous species, are very easy to breed, but we also study a monogamous species, and we study why this species is monogamous, the other one's promiscuous, and this monogamous species is particularly challenging to breed. But, hmm. yeah. Can you remember how far back you wanted to do science? I think since I was... Pretty young, a child, I was interested in figuring out how things work. I didn't know exactly I would be a scientist, but I thought I wanted to study something related to, mm -hmm. to discovery. And and then, yeah, I think after high school, I I knew I wanted to do, be a scientist, but decided to go through medical right. school to study more biomedical-related um, basic uh, science and pathology, etc. So uh, at any point, did you think about going back to, to work in Mexico? I did. I I did consider it, but as you know, it's very science in Mexico is uh, not as well funded as here, and yeah. it's uh, the structural uh, support is it's not like here. So for now, and yeah. I'm I'm happy where I am. I I can do what I want, but I try to interact with Mexican scientists, mm -hmm. friends, and uh, to support in some way. Yeah. I have a c couple of uh, colleagues in Mexico. They're all virologists, mm -hmm. but. Now they say it's particularly hard. Yeah, with this new government, there's been so many cuts and not funding anything that's not essential. Yeah. PhD students in abroad have had to come home because their scholarships from the government were cut out. Yeah. It's, it's My friend who's a senior professor, she said just to travel, she needs to get high-level approval. I know. This is crazy. Yeah. So is there neuro neuroscience in Mexico? Yeah, there's very good mm -hmm. uh, neuroscience uh, systems, neuroscience with uh, primates and cellular neuroscience. Uh, yeah, actually, when I was in Mexico, I wasn't particularly interested in neuroscience. I mm -hmm. was more interested in cancer and uh, uh, genetic toxicology, how environmental mutagens cause mutations and cause cancer and why mm -hmm. some people get cancer and some don't. So I, I got much more interested in neuroscience uh, in grad school. 
Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully at some future twin we can hear a little bit about your work. Right? Yeah, sure. When you publish a, uh, <laughs> well, you just published a nature paper, right? A couple of years. A couple of years ago. With, that was with, with Hopi. Mm-hmm. Let me, yeah, and it's uh, genetic basis of parental care evolution in monogamous mice. Yep. Cool. Yeah, well, um, well, it's a plan with each of uh, the twin members, right, to do some of their work at yeah. some point. So can I ask you a quick question? Sure. How did you decide to switch model systems? Yeah, I, I think C. elegans are <laughs> very powerful for studying very detailed mechanisms, and uh, there's a limit to the types of sophisticated behaviors they do, and I wanted to study something more relevant to vertebrates and mammals and humans, and and, and studied from more a natural perspective what's important for animals in, in the wild in nature. So this paramiscus might seem to be like a great opportunity for studying ethologically relevant behaviors. And, mm. and we had genetic tools to figure out their genetic basis of these differences. And, and now with more modern viral tools, we can go and use modern circuit tracing and manipulation experiments to express the same viruses we use in lab mice to use them with these mice. So now we can uh, start exploring yeah, the more I mechanisms. Mean, I am... Um I loved your nature paper. You know, part of uh, why I loved it is that I think the evolutionary uh, part of it has been somewhat neglected in neuroscience. So, yep. you know, I've been thinking a lot about at the molecular level mm-hmm. uh, how various um, parts of the synapse have evolved. But uh, in terms of behavior, ultimately, that's what the brain does. And so, you know, understanding the evolutionary origins is going to be key. Yeah, I think it's very powerful, just intrinsically interesting how behavior evolves and the nature of variation and what gets selected. But also, I think we can use it as a sort of an unbiased forward genetics tool. Mm-hmm. If we figure out how things evolve, we can hope to discover novel aspects about the brain and behavior instead of using a candidate gene. I'm going to knock this gene out or, or and see what happens to behavior, yeah. study this brain region. So I think it can be powerful for these two perspectives. Yeah, at some point I'm going to ask you, so I still don't understand how innate behavior gets selected for, but that's yeah. something we can, <laughs> we can We'll need a whole episode, sure. Okay, we could do yeah. that. Yeah, and we can talk about ARC and or and how it evolved in only terrestrial animals or yeah. vertebrates. Yeah. That's also very interesting, yeah, how some fundamental molecules can be so specialized for a group of animals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Neat. Well, uh, this, uh, if you're a beginner in neuroscience, this episode, I guess the next couple are, are for you, right? I'm a beginner. So, Ori, what's the plan for today? So today, Jason will take us on a journey through synaptic transmission <laughs> and plasticity. Um, and then we'll discuss a paper that is now about 15 years old um, that worked on one mecha- molecular mechanism of that controls synaptic plasticity. Uh, in neurons. Okay. Jason, take it away. All right. Yeah. So this is going to be a little bit um, of a one-on-one on how how uh, neurons, the cells in the brain, communicate. And of course, most of us know that we have billions of, of cells in the brain uh, and they're all connected. The neurons are connected with each other through synapses. So one one neuron, so one sort of a uh, pyramidal neuron, a neuron in your cortex can have up to a, a, at least a thousand different synapses. So just imagine one cell and you've got these tiny connections and there's thousands of them. So super complicated. Uh, so how many, and, how many total synapses are there in the brain? Well, in a human brain, it's something like a trillion. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot. <laughs> it's amazing that it works. <laughs> it's amazing it works. <laughs> well, I mean, amazing is that the – so there's a trillion synapses, but the connectivity is very precise. And that precision of how uh, synapses are connecting to each other is half – some of it's hardwired. So you have genes that tell um, the, the neuron where, where it should be connecting to. And then um, on the other side, there's sculpting of those synapses uh, to really refine the circuit mm. – um, that mediates specific behaviors, and that some of that's um, done through experience. And uh, we'll talk about, you know, how plasticity, the the changes in those synapses and how they connect to each other. That's called plasticity, and that's actually 
what this paper is uh, largely about. So when you're born, you don't have all the synapses that you will end up with, right? A human, anyway. Right. So um, the actually, when we're born, we have, we think, more synapses than we need. Yeah. So the brain makes a lot of synapses that are sort of just waiting to get a signal to say, okay, should I uh, stick around or not? And uh, over, over development, especially in humans, because our uh, development is quite long, uh, you lose synapses. Uh, and that's because the, specific, the, the circuits need to be refined. And that's all based on um, the experience that you have as you, as you um, grow up. When does that stop getting paired, roughly? Well, I think so. I would say most most uh, estimates are you know, at the end of your teens or somewhere in your teens. So uh, there, there has been some uh, experiment. Well, there's been some data showing that there's maybe even differences between men and women. But um, uh, we won't go into the stereotypes. But but I think that um, <laughs> everyone agrees that uh, you know roughly at the end of your teens, your your brain is fully developed. Hmm. One and one more question for now. So, do we know what a good experience is to have from birth on to give you good synapses? Or <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the immediate implication there is that, um, and and we know this, of course, that what you do experience during your childhood is is really important. Mm. Um, and we'll take a simple example. Uh, so, a lot of the the synapses that get refined are the ones that deal with the senses, so vision, auditory, uh, that sort of thing. And that's partly because, of course, your brain is trying to make sense of the world. And uh, so if you have a defect in one of those senses, so let's say you're born with uh, a cataract or your eyes are misaligned, so this, the information coming into the brain is not, um, not normal. And it, so the brain then is unable to make sense of the visual input. And then over time, you essentially become blind. And but so now we could, rest, you know, we can restore vision in the retina. So let's say you get rid of the cataract. Uh, the brain still has to make sense of the information. And, and so we think that there's these uh, early developmental windows where you can do that. So if you... Uh, correct the, the the visual impairment early, the brain can make sense of the information and then you're good to go. But if uh, if the cataract's only restored, let's say, after you're you know, a teenager, so you're an adult, um, uh, then the brain can't make a sense of the information and it doesn't have enough plasticity to, to restore vi the, the visual processing. So even though the retina, the eye is totally fine, um, they're essentially still blind because the the brain can't um, figure out the information. So th that's just one example of the key. You, know, you really need the right experience early um, to to have the brain make sense of of the world. Yeah, these are usually called critical periods for mm. many of right. us. Right. As uh, aside from vision and hearing, let's say if your parents read to you at an early age, does that do we know that that makes a difference or play music or whatever? That sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, of course, um, human children are, are amazingly adept at, at, at uh, learning languages. And, you know, if you're exposed to multiple languages as a kid, it's, you pick them up, yeah. you know, without conscious awareness. And, uh, and but as you, as you age, it becomes harder and harder. So getting exposed to that kind of um, you know, reading, different languages, mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 definitely it makes an, a big impact. And in mice, there's also evidence going back to parental care and that differences or parental deprivation affects the development of non-sensory areas like mm. parts of the frontal lobe lobe of the brain where information is integrated and higher cognitive processes that can be delayed or impaired if you don't receive uh, enough parental care early on. Mm. Yeah, and some of yeah, my, exactly. Some of my thesis work has been on non-sensory area maturation of non-sensory areas during development and thinking about how this can happen. Nice. Yeah. And, and of course, that means that so if you have traumatic uh, events early on as a, as a child, they they ultimately can have a large impact on how you, you're able to deal with um, trauma or, or uh, 
even just normal um you know relationships later on and part of that and there's there's actually a lot of evidence both in in humans and in animals that um you can be predisposed to anxiety and depression and sort of mental illness because of those traumatic events early in, in, and that's part, I think partly because that's when your brain is so sensitive to um, what it's experiencing. Um, all right, so synapses, back to synapses. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so of course you you know most people I think have some concept of how this works and uh, the brain works through electrical activity, and uh, that is in the form of what we call action potentials. And the, the way, and we can't really, you don't have time to go into super detail here, but um, so a neuron has uh, a particular voltage, and it maintains that voltage through concentrations of ions, so things like potassium and sodium. And uh, when you when you get an action potential, that is because you have a change in the voltage of of the neuron, and that's mediated through changes in the concentration of ions outside the neuron versus inside, and that happens through uh, channels receptors that can um, let the ions flow in and out of the the neuron. So that's sort of the basic electrical activity. It's 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 um, propagated uh, from one neuron to another across the synapse. And this is where it gets a little strange. So the electrical activity in most synapses gets converted to a uh, chemical transmission. So that's when the action potential triggers neurotransmitter release from the one side of the synapse to the other. So the presynaptic to the postsynaptic side. And so that neurotransmitter release then uh, gates receptors on the postsynaptic side, the other side of the, the the synapse, and again lets in ions, and that then renews this electrical activity. So the 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 neuron is depolarized, and that can trigger the action potential in that neuron. So essentially, what synapses or most synapses are doing in the brain is converting electrical activity on one side into chemical transmission and then that chemical transmission um, uh, instigates another action potential and that's how you get propagation of um, the electrical activity and uh, but it's slow so because uh, the electrical activity has to be converted b back to chemical and then and, and then um, into electrical it's it's much slower than you you would think because if you just had electrical activity that flows through a wire for example it's very quick um so so that's that's how the synapse works but maybe you should tell people who are not experts how slow can be really milliseconds <laughs> right yeah that's true so milliseconds <laughs> versus you know uh an electrical current that that's that's almost instantaneous right yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's cuz the electricity is speed of light basically right 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 flow of ion uh flow of you know electrons exactly yeah. mm. um so this is ongoing, so this takes energy, uh, the presynaptic side, the, the way the neurotransmitter gets released is through these uh, packets of neurotransmitter, so these vesicles, so the neur neurotransmitter gets concentrated in vesicles on the presynaptic side, and there's a ton of proteins that then regulate uh, the amount of neurotransmitter that's released uh, when it happens and uh, what kind of neurotransmitter gets uh, packaged into the, the vesicles. So there's then different kinds of synapses based on what kind of neurotransmitter is there, and um, there are various properties about the release of the, the neurotransmitter that can, can vary. Uh, and then on the other side, you can um, have a lot of different kinds of receptors that get activated by the neurotransmitter, so the one that we're going to talk about today um, is a glutamate receptor, and glutamate is the the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, and the type of glutamate receptor we're going to look at is called the AMPA type, and the AMPA type is the main receptor that um, is is uh, in the excitatory uh, synapses. Um, 
so so that's I think hopefully that's enough in, information to sort of s- launch off with. But the, the only other thing I'll say until we and then we can get into the paper is that um, the way we think information is then processed and uh, and stored in terms of memory is that there's a, a specific set of synapses that connect uh, between neurons, and uh, the strength of those synapses can decrease or increase uh, depending on the the experience of the animal, and that simple change in the strength of the synapses is what we think uh, can mediate the the formation of the circuits, the particular neurons that are connected to each other um, in that particular memory or that that particular that mediates that particular behavior that that the animals is, is doing. Um, so you know it's relatively simple to think about because it's strengthening or weakening of the synapse. Uh, but as we'll see when we get into the actual, mechanisms of how this happened it, it, it gets uh, complex uh, quickly so when we talk about synaptic strength it's not clear to me what what we mean by that you know a weak versus a strong synapse what does that actually mean yeah so good question so so a strong synapse so you can think of it at baseline um there's a certain amount of neurotransmitter that's released and there's a certain amount of receptors that get um, activated and so we can measure the strength of a particular synapse in, in a few ways, but the the main or most sensitive way is to measure how the electrical um, activity changes. So whether the the uh, the cell depolarizes, whether there's enough ions that flow uh, through the receptors to make a difference in the voltage of the the neuron. And so uh, an individual synapse alone you know makes a small change in the the voltage uh but then of course you've got many synapses on a single neuron and together they 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 combine to Mm. um depolarize the cell usually in the case of excitatory neurotransmission uh so we can we can measure that voltage change that's probably the most sensitive way of measuring um how powerful a synapse is and that the change in uh, the iron flow is another way to to measure that. Okay. Okay. Now, when we talk about synapses, everything that happens in the nervous system happens through a synapse, like everything from muscle movement to sensing heat to um, uh, thinking about problems. And everything is, is mediated by synaptic transmission. Would that be fair? Or are there other ways that uh, activities can be mediated. I, I would say that's fair. Um, I think that that's only how most neuroscientists see see the brain as mm. it's all like it's electrical activity through synapses. Um, there are, but there are other other sort of things that happen that are maybe even slower than synapses that that um, can change how the brain works and we call those neuromodulators there and that's something else that we could probably talk about later on but mm-hmm. um, okay yeah there i mean there are also extrasynaptic receptors that can that are not within the synapse but sense the same neurotransmitters okay but they're in, they're at the they're on the dendrite they're on the membrane, uh, okay. but like they're spillover outside of the synapse mm-hmm. yeah and there are other synapses that are not chemical but they're also electrical they mm. they make a gap between the two the pre and the post synaptic neurons but instead of like a chemical signal going through the ions go through these mm. channels and they communicate uh much faster and okay. there's many of those synapses so. but whatever we do involves these different kinds of synapses from you know react running to yeah. thinking and so forth mm-hmm. even yep. though, even i'm just sitting here thinking and listening yep. there's some synaptic activity that's mediating that right right that's yeah. right be <laughs> bad if there wasn't <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> when you can't figure out the answer, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. And so at any point, you know, I'm sleeping, still, there's still synaptic activity happening, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually sleeping is a really uh, interesting topic because um, there's even specific kinds of uh, activity that happens during sleep um, mm-hmm. that we think is important for brain function, everything from actually memory consolidation uh, to just keeping the brain healthy. 
And I guess after you die, then it stops, but it probably doesn't stop immediately, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it happens pretty quickly because the all that the, the reason you know there's a reason why your brain is um, it needs all this energy. I think this I don't know what the exact statistic is. It's something like twenty percent of all the energy of your body is required um, for the brain, mm-hmm. and so um, it takes a lot of um, uh, energy for for the syn- this whole cycle of synaptic transmission. So it, it stops pretty quickly after the, after death. Okay. All right, so you're done with synaptic introductions, right? I yeah, I, I think so. Uh, but of course, yeah, as as we go along, if there's, um, we, we're counting on you, Vincent, to tell us when when we're. Uh, yeah, you know, I, will. I will. <laughs> no, I'm I'm in, I'm immensely curious. So uh, it's it's also interesting that essentially all animals use the the same molecular mm-hmm. building blocks right. for synapses. They all work essentially the same way, from the mm-hmm. corals to um, jellyfish to uh, Worms to flies to humans, we have essentially the same components. That's another thing I was going to ask. So anything that has any kind of a nervous system uses the same basic essentially structures. Yeah. So yeah, uh, so exactly, and that's why we think that if we understand the building blocks of synapses, even in a mouse, that it should be, um, you know, very applicable to even human brains. uh, And there may be some nuances, but essentially the same core Mm -hmm. uh, set of proteins are involved. Yeah, interestingly, some of these things evolved from even simpler organisms. We find some of the same machinery in yeast, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Yeast use it to secrete things into the outside of sure. their cells, sure. and we use the same molecules to secrete neurotransmitters between our right. neurons. Even though yeast don't have any kind of nervous system, right? They exactly. have some of the building blocks, right? right? Right, right. So, what is the evolutionarily speaking? What is the oldest organism that has a True synapse, like we like we've been talking about today. You said jellyfish, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, is there? I, I remember seeing something about sponges. Yeah. Well, I, but I don't know if they have a, a synapse as we would sort of conceptualize. They have the building blocks. Yeah, I mean the nematode, like C. elegans, has. Right, but there's things even oh, yeah. older even than older. nematodes. Yeah, yeah. nematodes yeah. Yeah. for sure. But there's things like. Uh, or je- jellyfish are evolutionarily right. older. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we, last week on Twivo, we did a paper on coanoflagellates. Right. Uh, a new one yeah. came out so showing yeah. that there's a new one that forms a cup and it contracts. Right. So yeah, one of the co-first authors, uh, Tess uh, Linden, she was also in Hopi's lab uh, okay. studying. Uh, so there's got to be a way for all those cells to communicate to all. Right. Maybe they don't have a nervous system, but maybe a rudiment of it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's actually one way to see, think about it is that all of this is uh, just an extreme av- adaptation of cells signaling to each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Ori, you picked this paper, right? Yeah. Put, all, it, put all the blame on me. If no, that- <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a, would you say it's a good primer on synaptic activity? Yeah. And I think it is a good primer on plasticity and also like to think about the systems that people use to study these mm-hmm. these processes. Would you say this is a classic? I would say it's a classic. <laughs> it's vinyl. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's old. <laughs> it's old. It's old. It's funny you say this. It's old, old format. <laughs> yeah. this, this was published in 2004. So uh-huh. the papers I think old are like 70s, oh, sure. 60s, yeah. even 50s. And right. the thing is, if you look at those, it's just so simple by today's yeah. standards, yeah. right? It's, and there's a, usually a written in a narrative form. We decided to look at this and then found this. You know, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, so this, so the paper is called "Recycling Endosomes Supply Amper Receptors for LTP," um, and the last author is Michael Ellers, and the other authors are Mick Young Park, Esther Pennick, Jeffrey Edwards, and Julie Cower. Um, and this was published in Science in 2004. Is from Duke, right? Uh-huh. Yes. Duke and Brown. Yes. So uh, AMPA stands for what? We didn't ever actually define it, I think. Yeah, that's uh, it's because it's a long chemical <laughs> name. That oh, you don't okay. Need to know. <laughs> okay. It's, it's basically yeah. uh, um, 
the way these receptors were originally discovered, uh, the subtypes was through drug, okay. various, using just various drugs. And so it's, a, it's actually a, a chemical name for a drug that specifically activates this kind of glutamate receptor, but not important. Um, but there, there are other acronyms here that we're going to have to uh, yeah. unpack. For sure. So the, and they don't even specify what AMPA is in the introduction of this paper. So I guess yeah. Yeah. I know. it's exciting. Yeah. 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 Know it. <laughs> so the next acronym is LTP. So um, this stands for long-term potentiation. So there are two ways you can change synaptic strength. You can weaken synapses. This would be called long-term depression. Mm-hmm. Or you can strengthen them. This would be called long-term potentiation. And that depression has nothing to do with the depression we feel if we don't get a grant funded, for example. Right? <laughs> no, this is a very molecular, <laughs> cellular. Okay. Case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and the idea of long-term is that you have some sort of stimulus that then affects this synapse mm-hmm. for a, a while after the stimulus is stopped or withdrawn. Um, now we talk about milliseconds or, or even longer. no, I mean, minutes to hours. Ah, okay. So there are some, well, classic papers where they record for <laughs> 24 hours from hippocampal slices wow. and see potentiation for that long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and we'll, we'll explain what recycling endosomes are in a little bit, but let's kind of think more on background and, and first talk about the experimental system that they use. So a lot of this work is done in dissociated neuronal cultures. So in this case, they take, um, I think they're rats here, um, and they take the hippocampus, they dissociate it. Why the hippocampus in particular? So the hippocampus. Well, Jason, maybe you can answer this. <laughs> but yeah. there's, I mean, there's so, been a lot of work on this. Um, yeah, yeah. So the you know so the goal actually of of well the, the bigger picture goal of the work here is under the idea that uh, the strengthening weakening of synapses is required for memory encoding and storage, and um, the hippocampus is the part of the brain that we think is the main structure that is required for making new memories, and um, there's actually a lot of evidence for this, and this goes back to even uh, human. Uh, patients that had their hippocampi removed because of epilepsy. And there's a particular famous patient called HM who had this happen to him and after the the surgery could not make new memories at all for the rest of his life. Mm. Uh, he basically had a memory of, of about five minutes. So he could, you know, you come back five minutes after you've met him the first time and he would not recognize you. So it was a very, wow. very severe defect in uh, making new memories. And that's that's actually the main one of the main reasons why the hippocampus is is a well studied structure. Okay. The other reason is that this plasticity, um, these strengthening and weakening of synapses, is really easy to see in the hippocampus because the connectivity, so the way the synapses are arranged, is very ordered, and then, so there's basically three cells that are connected to each other through through these uh, synapses. And because we know uh, exactly where they are connected, we can stimulate one set of cells and record from another set of cells and know exactly um, which synapses are being uh, activated. And so I, I'll just add two things. One is that, so the hippocampus is responsible also for explicit memories. So mm-hmm. kind of thinking about an event in your life or where you are. Um, there are other parts of the brain that are important for implicit memories. So, for example, knowing complex motor tasks or um, kind of subconscious thoughts and behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, so it also makes it easier to study the, kind of the behavioral consequences of changes in the hippocampus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you, so they dissociate this thing, the the hippocampus to put in culture. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so you get this dissociated culture that be- can become synaptically mature over the course of w- days to weeks. So the, the, the neurons form new synapses because they've been dissociated. Right? Yeah, so they're just cell bodies. They're plated and then, or rounded, I guess, neurons, and then the dendrites and axons regrow from these in the dish. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the synapses are functional. There can also be inhibitory um, neurons and excitatory neurons in these cultures. Um, and this is really great for, for example, microscopy approaches where you can see individual dendrites from one neuron and track mm-hmm. molecules in them and do really nice cell biology. Whereas if you take it in a, in the brain, it's obviously kind of this mush of mm. cells that are hard to see. So besides neurons, are there other cell types here in these cultures or you get rid of those? So 
I th- so I think that for the most part, these hippocampal cultures, you eliminate, you get rid of astrocytes by adding drugs that inhibit their growth. Okay. Um, yeah, there's there's various forms. But, um, I would say the most common is that they that we leave about five percent of the cells are astrocytes because we know, and this is another big topic that you actually need. Uh, glia, which are the uh, the non neuronal cell types in the brain, that, um, for making synapses. That there's a lot of signals that are actually being sent from glia to to mature synapses, and so it's actually either you condition the media with glia. So we do this too, where we just grow astrocytes alone, take the media from the astrocytes and um, use that on the neurons or you can grow uh, the neurons with some some astrocytes in the the dish itself and so this is in contrast to dopamine neurons for example which our lab works on where you actually have to grow them on a monolayer of astrocytes or they won't grow and even if you have a cover slip above the astrocytes it's not sufficient they have to be in physical contact, contact. Okay. Yeah, yeah so these are ampa Neurons, is that what you would These call? are glutamate neurons. Glutamate. Right? Glutamatergic neurons, yeah. Okay. And no, those don't need to be in contact with other cells, with glia. I think that that, w- that would be a fair thing to yeah. say, right, Jason? Yeah, I mean, um, although I would say um, we can study them this way. Uh, it may not reflect exactly how they work yeah. in vivo because we actually know that those astrocytes are really close in contact with a lot of the synapses um, in the, the intact brain and that can, they can influence the properties of the synapse. That's, that's a caveat with using these cultures. Okay, good. Okay, so, um, so the other thing that had been done until b- before this paper was to think about how synaptic strength can change. Mm-hmm. So one way you could imagine is that release of neurotransmitter from the presynaptic side could increase Mm -hmm. or postsynaptic sensitivity to neurotransmitter could increase. Okay. And work from several groups, I would argue pretty conclusively demonstrated that it's a change in the postsynaptic sensitivity to the neurotransmitter that mediates synaptic plasticity at these synapses. I guess we knew that there were receptors on the postsynapse, right, for these transmitters by the, by this paper. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We know that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so the idea might be one idea would be there are more receptors, right? Right. Okay. So and that and so I think the at this point the paper tries to address the question of where do these receptors come from when there is more when there are more receptors mm-hmm. after some sort of stimulus, and the idea for or kind of the takeaway from the paper is that these receptors are actually sitting in an intracellular reservoir i Uh, guess it's good to take a step back there's two main options right they could be synthesized from scratch new Mm -hmm. protein new receptors or they could be just coming back from the membrane and recycling more stuff at the membrane at the receptor right so these are the two things they try to tease apart yes right yeah 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 um right so the takeaway is that they actually come down on the side of the there are not new receptors that are made, but instead they're brought back into the membrane from an intracellular store. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these are, so um, the way that they start to think about this is that they first address whether the AMP receptors on the surface of the cell are in a dynamic population and whether they're trafficking in and out of the synapse. And to address this, they express a series of proteins that are um, in a family of GTPases that regulate membrane trafficking, and you can express dominant negative forms of these proteins to inhibit, um, for example, recycling from an endosome or an intracellular vesicle to the surface or vice versa. And one question that they ask is whether expressing these dominant negative proteins to inhibit recycling from these intracellular endosomes to the surface, whether that affects steady state levels of AMPA receptors on the synaptic surface. And they find that indeed, um, if you block recycling, AMPA receptors build up in an intracellular compartment. So there's kind of this basal turnover of AMPA receptors from the surface into this intracellular population and back to the surface. And I guess they detect those by staining with antibodies, is that right? Yeah, so you can stain, you can kind of do an antibody feeding assay where you stain the extra, uh, you have an antibody that binds to an extracellular epitope on the channel and then you can see it go in, you can pulse chase essentially and see the local to this, this is to antibodies to the glutamate receptor. Receptor, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. So 
at baseline, this suggests that there is a rec- like a baseline amount of recycling of AMPA receptors. Mm-hmm. And the next question they ask is, what about during synaptic plasticity? So if you give a stimulus that should strengthen the synapse, do you need to have it kind of an on-demand increase in recycling from these endosomes? Um, and the way they induce this plasticity in culture is by adding glycine, which is um, a agonist of another type of glutamate receptor called an NMDA receptor. And NMDA receptors are different from EMPA receptors for two main reasons. Uh, one is that at the normal voltage or membrane potential of a neuron, they're inactive and they're or they're not open and they're blocked by a magnesium ion that sits in the channel, which is actually discovered here at Columbia. Um, and which I thought was cool. And then who, who did that? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I don't remember her name. <laughs> okay. Actually, yeah, I yeah. Don't I'll either. Mm. I yeah. We can look her up later. It wasn't Kendall, right? No, no, it wasn't yeah. Kendall. No, it was. I don't. Yeah, she was, was in. Se- maybe it might have been Steven Siegel. No, it was a. It was a woman in pharmacology, and I can't. Uh, yeah. Mm. What, what was? No, be- what is, it's a uh, NMDA receptor. Yeah, I think Amy is her first name. So she yeah, discovered NMDA that. Is an, an, I was going to say the NMDA is another chemical, so uh, just like the AMPA. <laughs> the AMPA was also a chemical. Um, so, But these NMDA receptors are also permeable to ions, to calcium, which is a divalent cation. Mm-hmm. And in neurons, calcium is an important signaling molecule that um, in many ways is kind of an activator of synaptic plasticity. So if the NMDA receptor is activated, you have increased calcium influx, and then this leads to synaptic changes in synaptic strength. And so this is, when you add glycine, that's what happens to these cultures, right? Yeah, you open up. So you're basically initiating a potential by adding the glycine, glycine, is that right? You want to make a a signal at the synapse we're studying with the AMP receptors, right? Right. I mean, this is a a crude method, right? Yeah. So... Um, if we go back to thinking about synaptic plasticity as a mechanism for memory formation, you would think that these should be s- synapse specific, right? Yeah, that, yeah. But in this case, we're just they're just potentiating the whole culture, right? They're dumping but, but, yeah. um, I, but I want to mention something about the NMDA receptor that's actually very cool, I think, and that and that goes to what uh, Ori was saying. So. Um, you know, we, the way we think the a specific set of neurons get uh, connected to each other is by strengthening the synapses between those neurons that are active uh, during the, the memory or the learning task. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so there was this, a theoretical, uh, really influential theoretical uh, proposition or, or model for how this could work by a Canadian neuroscientist co- called Donald Hebb. And basically, you can paraphrase this to say that the cells that fire together, the action potentials, wire together. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you, in order to do that, you, you need uh, synapse specificity, as Ori says. And the NMDA receptor is, a, is actually a perfect molecular tool for this because it can, it can um, act as a coincidence detector. So, for, for the NMDA receptor to to be active, you need two things. You need the cell that it's uh, that um, that the NMDA receptor is on to be depolarized, so it has to have had a um, it has to be active, and uh, it has to have glutamate bound to it at the same time. So what that means is that uh, you could have activity, so that neuron has to be active, and the specific synapse that uh, releases glutamate. Uh, will then activate the NMDA, NMDA receptor. So you need those two events to happen within a very close window of time for the NMDA receptor to to be active. So it basically acts as a as a coincidence detector and can actually explain a lot of uh, the properties of the induction of synaptic plasticity in that it's um, both sp- synapse specific and it's a associative as in like the you need these neurons to be active together so, so the bottom line here is that you since you have a culture of neurons you have to have a artificial way of initiating uh, pulses across the synapse right right and glycine right. is one way through this now these nmda receptors are they where where so we're talking about a synapse with a- ampa receptors on post synapse 
but not on pre-synapse, right? Correct. Yeah. So right. where are the NMDAs? Are they pre? Post. Post. post, post they're also, also post. Yeah. yeah, and so they're they're on they're on, they're on the same synapses as the APRA. Synapses. APRA. Okay. They're and, close together. And also, it's, so this was done in vitro in, in dissociated cultures, but yeah. since then others have done it in vivo in real brains, uh, right? Where you can release glutamate in a specific synapse, and then you can see what are the effects on the Maggie. synaptic plasticity and growth of new synapses. And, so this was early on, fifteen years ago, yeah, but this sure. has been validated through other experiments. So you can put a needle in and re- release. You can, drugs you can do that or there are other very fancy tools where you can have a molecule that's sensitive to light. So it's holding on to glutamate uh-huh. and then it's called uh, uncaging where you shine light and that releases I the see. glutamate yeah, specifically cool. in one specific. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we'll do those at some episode 100, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's yeah. some really cool you know, yeah. things that I, we can do with lasers these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, so this is actually a a difficult problem to address. And I think that this was part of why this paper is quite interesting because they come up with a unique way to measure newly inserted AMPA receptors. And the way they do this is they put uh, epitope tags, in this case, a hemagglutinin tag on the end terminus of the AMPA receptor. Mm -hmm. And then between the HA tag and the AMPA receptor, they add a thrombin cleavage site. So what they can do is they can add thrombin to the culture. They can cleave off all the hemagglutinin on the surface. Mm-hmm. And then they can look after a stimulus for newly inserted AMP receptors that still have the HA on them. Yeah, cool. Um, and what they see is that after glycine treatment, there's an increase in the amount of HA labeled um, AMP receptors, suggesting that there's insertion from some intracellular area that's protected from thrombin in the culture. And that this is blocked by expression of these dominant negative GTPases. Mm-hmm. And they do some in- interesting controls that get at the specificity of this event. So it's not that they're disrupting global vesicular trafficking, because if they express dominant negative GTPases that affect vesicular trafficking at different parts of the endosomal system, so for example, from the trans Golgi um, exit from the trans Golgi, then there's no effect on synaptic plasticity or AMP receptor insertion. Um, and then the other thing that I that I thought was very nice was that they showed that this trafficking is specific for AMP receptors. So NMDA receptors don't change levels on the surface, and this is and so it's independent of mm-hmm. kind of recycling in that way. So and then at this point they address this question that Andreas brought up, which is whether this is in this mechanism happens in addition to increased synthesis of these proteins. Um, and so if they add a protein synthesis inhibitor, they don't block the potentiation of synapses or the increase in the amount of AMP receptors on the surface. And I'd say that this is in contrast to other forms of synaptic plasticity where they are protein synthesis dependent. Mm. Okay. So that's not a general property. I was wondering if it made sense because protein synthesis takes a while, right? So if you want to be rapid response, you would have you would rather mobilize something that you're already stored away, right? Uh-huh. But that's not always the case, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. And so this plasticity, so the, you could think of this plasticity as broken broken down into three phases. There's the induction, which is the chem, the signal, signaling cascade that starts, starts it all off. And that's uh, usually re- use it, require, requires the NMDA receptor. Uh, and then the expression mechanism is the number of AMP receptors that are at the synapse. Mm-hmm. Um, and that all happens very quickly uh, within a few seconds to minutes after the induction um, of plasticity. What, what's really unclear, and this is actually the problem that my lab is trying to address, is uh, the maintenance of the plasticity. So how do you keep a synapse at a certain strength over hours to days to years, uh, despite the fact that the proteins that are at the synapse, including the receptors, turn over within, you know, at most a few days. Uh, and so that maintenance part of it or the, the, the consolidation of the plasticity requires protein synthesis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was kind of classically shown by, I guess, like Joe Ledoux in the amygdala showing that fear conditioning, so associating a sensory cue with a f- uh, fearful memory is dependent on protein synthesis. Mm-hmm. So if they put a protein synthesis inhibitor into a part of the brain in a rat, the rat won't freeze in response to a shock or a cue that's associated with a shock. 
Yeah, and actually, goes even earlier than that. So in the '60s, there was some. Uh, this is and this is going to sound funny, but there were experiments on goldfish, <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's pr- pr- maybe where the the saying comes from. But there was um, uh, a group of scientists looking at memory in goldfish, and, and they showed that if you block protein synthesis, you block uh, long term memory. I thought goldfish don't have long-term memory. <laughs> well, you know, long-term for a goldfish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so in the in the last part of the paper, they kind of address this in a different model system. So in, in an intact brain slice. Um, so what they've done is they make these acute brain slices um, and they can culture them for... So these are organotypic cultures. That's, um, that's what we do. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, Except we dis- we infect them and destroy them. <laughs> well, these so th- these are also infected. Um, so they so you can culture these organotypic cultures for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Um, you can and for in this case they have the hippocampus and so the circuitry is intact, just right. as Jason described these multiple synapses. Um, and what they can do then is they can infect with, in this case, a Synbis virus to express these dominant negative proteins or anything else. So, mm-hmm. And this has become a major tool in neuroscience, not necessarily with Synbis viruses, but with other types of viruses like adeno-associated viruses. Um, and what they see is that using uh, electrical um, stimulus, so f- um, inducing firing in once at a synapse at a certain frequency, um, induces a plasticity that is dependent on recycling or insertion of amp receptors that is mediated by recycling endosomes. Mm-hmm. So this kind of all brings it back into this intact circuit where you haven't dissociated the cells. They're not in glass cover slip. There's a semi-physiologically relevant stimulus as opposed to just adding glycine to the dish. So a, a major part of this is patch clamp recording, mm. right? Maybe you could explain what that is because we'll probably encounter it again <laughs> yes <laughs> or you want to do that or yeah sure i can do yeah. it that's my whole phd thesis <laughs> yeah, that's so my... i hope i can do that. <laughs> um and i'm defending in two weeks so i should get this down okay so <laughs> practice yeah. yeah practice right so um so as jason said neurons uh signal with electrical activity um, and we can record this in a number of different ways with a glass electrode that has a little filament inside mm-hmm. that then you can put essentially either on the cell membrane or you can insert inside the cell. Um, and that can measure the electrical activity of the cell relative to a reference, let's say, in the bath or outside of the cell. Um, and then you can do one better, which is that you can actually break the cell membrane. So you can have the, a little opening on the end of the glass mm-hmm. electrode. And if you apply suction with your mouth, for example, you can then break the cell membrane and your pipette becomes one with the cell. And this allows you to kind of pharmacologically manipulate the cell. You can add drugs inside your pipette that just goes into the cell that you're recording from or proteins, small proteins. Um, And then you can measure also much smaller currents because essentially the size of the current that you can measure is dependent on the resistance between the cell and the glass electrode. So if you have a very low resistance, so you have high access to the cell, you can measure very small currents, so even electrical responses to single vesicles being released. So let me, let me get this straight. So you apply suction, you break off a piece of the membrane? No, you can. So that's one way to record. So you can pull the glass electrode back and pull off a piece, piece of, of membrane. membrane. Right. But in this case, what? so this is called the whole cell recording. You okay. create a hole and then the membrane essentially attaches to the glass electrode and there's a hole between from the cell into the inside of the glass electrode. Got it. Okay. So the, the patch refers to the place where the electrode is covering basically, right? Yes. And what's the clamp come from? Right. So the clamp is that we can do these recordings by either um, setting the voltage of the cell, so clamping the voltage nice. through the pipette, or clamping the amount of current that goes into the cell. Um, and so that's where the clamp comes okay. from. So using this, you can measure the electrical impulses that go down a neuron, for example. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And then you can apply conditions of all sorts, drugs, dominant negative proteins, and see the effect on 
Yeah, and, and not only that, you can measure the uh, activity of individual channels. So, mm-hmm. for example, AMP receptors, you can pharmacologically isolate or eliminate other currents in the cell mm-hmm. or potassium channels, NMDA receptors, all these different kinds of things. So, in these uh, in these experiments, what are you measuring? You have time on one axis, and what is the why? Is it, is it electrical is it amperage, for so, example? So what they're right. So in this case, um, this is uh, so it's the y-axis is normalized EPSC, so excitatory postsynaptic current. I see. So this is in voltage clamp, and what they're doing is so to induce the plasticity, they stimulate the slice with a certain paradigm of electrical pulses, and then they're testing the synaptic strength by then stimulating with a test pulse. So usually like a single pulse mm-hmm. that then they can. It evokes release, and you can measure the strength of the synapse over a period of time. So in this case, they measure over 40 minutes. Um, and then the really – so the reason I was attracted to patch clamping initially is that you have a lot of control over your experimental system. So as I mentioned, you can load things into the cell. Um, but in this case, you can measure the strength of a single – of a synapse on a single cell, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. in, you can normalize it to the baseline strength so you can have really nice kind of – low variability experiments over time, although there's lots of other variability in patch clip. So to do this, you need a microscope so you can see where you're putting the electrode, right? Right. So you have a microscope and you can do this with special optic systems where you can actually see inside these brain slices that are usually Mm -hmm. pretty thick, a couple hundred micrometers thick. Right. Um, And you can see, let's say, 50 to 100 microns into the slice. Um, And then you find the cell and can... um, record from them. All right, so you've spent many hours doing this, right? Oodles of hours, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, in, I mean, in my thesis, there are probably over a thousand cells that I've patched from, mm-hmm. something like that, yeah. Okay. So they do this, and what do they find again? You, you said it, but tell, me, tell us again. Um, so they find that uh, expressing the dominant negative proteins that we talked about earlier in culture that block recycling from endosomes to the surface. Got it blocks synaptic plasticity induced by giving electrical stimulation at a certain um at a certain in a certain pattern that is known to induce plasticity and they me- and they can measure that by these the patch clamping they can look at the the amperage and the effect of having these dominant negative mutants or not right so the, so what they they can do that so they can uh, compare cells that are expressing the dominant negative mutants at baseline, mm-hmm. but then they can also measure the baseline and then give a stimulus that is a pr- that induces plasticity and then measure afterwards and see whether the dominant negative expression of the dominant negative protein is required for the plasticity to happen. Can you say anything about um, uh, I don't know long term? Well, the, the the title is long term potentiation, right? So in a, in a patch clamp assay, how would you measure that? So here they're measuring the size of the current over the course of 30 to 40 minutes. So every okay. certain amount of time, every minute or a couple times a minute, they will probably record a test pulse and they can see the strength of this synapse. Got it. But to think about the time scale, the plasticity paradigm happens in four one-second trains, yeah. usually very fast, separated by only a couple seconds. So This is also a limitation of patch clamping right. in that um, – you can really only hold the cell for about half an hour to an hour at max. Right. And then the because you've made a hole in the neuron, stuff starts to leak out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so so it's you know, so that's the, the one limitation because of course if you really want to understand memory per se, you would want to uh, be able to look, come back much later, sure, you know, sure. much longer. But yeah. But but this would give you an indication of what's important for at least within an hour, right? Right. And then you could could do other experiments, as we've already mentioned, even in animals, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. So I think that that's kind of the takeaways from the paper. So I I think it's interesting that twice you've mentioned virus here. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see in all the papers that we do, how many of them use actually viruses or viral epitopes or vectors to do? I think a lot will... I would say almost everyone. (laughs) Almost all of them because, yeah, for whatever reason, neurons uh, are very hard to transfect. So you Mm -hmm. can't use Mm -hmm. conventional means. Um, They just get really low efficiency. Uh, So, yeah, we we basically rely on um, viruses to get uh, a lot of these genes into them. It's funny. We were just talking with uh, my associate Amy this morning. We have an experiment we want to do in cultured astrocytes. (laughs) 
And I said, well, just transfect the plasma. And she said, no, it's not really good. We have to use a virus <laughs> to get it in. So it's interesting. They do use Synbis here, which we know is a neuronotropic virus, probably why they use it. You could manipulate it. You can put genes in. But now no one uses Synbis. I guess they use Lentis, or you said AAV. Yeah, mostly AAVs. I mean, yeah, there's still some yeah. Synbis used for yeah. cerebellum, I mean, right? Yeah, it's partly because Synbus is more toxic. Yeah. One of the advantages of Synbus, though, over these other viruses is that you get uh, really high expression quickly. Yeah. Mm. Um, versus AVs, which take like a week to ramp up. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Same with the lentes, really. But of course, there the, the advantage is that once you have expression, it's um, it stays on for a long time. Well, RNA viruses are. They just rule, you know. (laughs) (laughs) The best That's what I've spent my entire career working on. Yeah. Very quick and high high expression within a short time. That's the strategy. Get in and out very quickly. Uh uh, Almost everything... Is uh, revolves around fast replication cycles, and then the DNA viruses are very different strategies. Mm-hmm. But also the hemagglutinin and epitope. It's interesting, right? That was one of the first epitopes we used with where we could have an antibody that recognized the short amino acid sequence that you could stick in a protein, right? Well, right. If you start counting all the molecular tools, like if you use reverse transcriptase to clone yeah. things, like yeah. then there's viruses everywhere, so, yeah. or viral tools. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about reverse transcriptase. Uh, in terms of the Nobel Prizes last week, I think that's one of the most revolutionary discoveries ever because we not only use it in research, but diagnostics routinely use RT, right? Because uh-huh. if you're going to PCR anything, you, you do RT-PCR a lot, right? It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Totally revolutionary. I mean, my whole career is built on RT, right? Because I <laughs> went went to Baltimore Lab a few years after its discovery, and I did a project with RT. But at the time you got the Nobel, it wasn't even, like all these diagnostics and therapeutics that have come from this were not even apparent, no, right? right? Not right. at all. Yeah, yeah. Much this was later. A, yeah, yeah. No, that's a cool thing. You make, uh, you, you identify something neat, and then you put the whole scientific community to thinking about it, and tons of great stuff happens, right? Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, uh, RT, sequencing, PCR, and now CRISPR, people are like modifying it left and right to do amazing things. That's the beauty of it. And that's the part, I I talked with an economy professor a few weeks ago, and she said, that's why science works is because to get recognized for something, you have to publish it. You have to make it a public good. (laughs) And then everyone has it and they can do whatever they want. And that's why science, you know, all these diagnostics and Everything. I, I just love it. I think it's such a great field because of that. Because you have this, it's really a collective mind, right? And then you develop something new and other people use it and it keeps moving forward. I love it. I just love it. Um, okay, so this tells us that there are um, the receptors for AMPA, AMPA receptors are coming from um, a pool of receptors in an endosomal pool inside the cell, right? Mm-hmm. Now, one of the implications is that if you have more transmission, they get more receptors. So how does that work? Do we know? So you can't have more receptors before you get a signal from the presynapse, right? Because it wouldn't know. The cell, the postsynapse wouldn't know to make more receptors automatically. Right, right. right. so you yeah. have initially a pool that's inside the cell ready to go to the membrane in case something happens, in case a signal comes. And there's a constitutive rate of... Right, of turnover. Recycle. And then as soon as a few um, molecules hit that receptor, something must happen to upregulate the recycle. So if, right. in this case, like, and let's say NMDA receptors are activated, calcium comes in, this changes membrane trafficking and recycling rates, right? And then, mm-hmm. so that's how you can transduce the signal. Yeah, and you know, one thing to think about here is that again, a complication of the neuron is that um, you you of course have transcription in the nucleus, and that potentially is could be very far away from a synapse, and and so there's all these signals that have to go from the the periphery, the dendrites, the mm-hmm. synapses, mm-hmm. to turn on transcription, and then you you know, let's say you make the protein in the cell body, and then that protein has to get back to the synapse, and in the case of receptors and transmembrane proteins, mm. they could potentially actually be inserted way away from the synapse, and then they have to get 
um, you know, diffuse or um, move into the synapse. So there's all these mechanisms of uh, getting the receptors to the right synapse and then capturing them and keeping them in there. And plasticity, the plasticity rules uh, all take advantage of those different points where the receptors could be, um, the expression could be modified. Mm. And so in this case, this is uh, creating a pool of receptors near the synapse that can be rapidly uh, put back into the membrane. So this, uh, t- tell us a little more about the synapse. So these are three-dimensional so that, you know, you look at pictures and they're always flat two-dimensional synapses, but they're, you know, I'm mm-hmm. looking at my two fists coming together and are the cells attached or and so are there proteins that mediate attachment at the synapse that keep it together? Yeah, so good question. There's um, the the space, there is space between the presynaptic side and the postsynaptic side, but that space is very small. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's actually evidence that um, there are there are membrane pro, transmembrane proteins on either side that span the synapse and they can actually keep it uh, attached uh-huh. um, or even formed. But there's no direct contact. There's a small space between. That's called the synaptic cleft where, mm-hmm. where the neurotransmitter um, is released. The other thing to know, though, here is that excitatory synapses are uh, a special case where um, most of the synapses are, are on what call, are called spines, so dendritic spines. Uh, and there's yeah. these mushroom-shaped um, protrusions from the dendrite that make the synapse. But you don't have to have that. You can have synapses that are on the shaft, the dendritic shaft, that don't have the, the spines. Mm. But, but um, we think that these excitatory uh, synapses mostly happen on the spines. And so then you can think of the spine as also having this 3D structure to it uh, that's also really important for function. Um, and uh, the simple rule again here is that if a synapse gets stronger, it also probably gets bigger. The spine itself can change its structure, gets bigger, and that can allow uh, the incorporation of more receptors. And then uh, depression has the sa- the opposite, where you can make mm. the synapse structurally smaller. Uh, and so, and so we think that the structure is in, is important for uh, also for the for memory as, as and maintenance of memory. So. The- Go ahead. Oh, sorry. That many of the mutations in autism and other psychiatric diseases actually affect the structure of the synapse, the structural uh-huh. components, yeah. not necessarily the neurotransmitter receptors, yeah. but what holds it together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say uh, prion diseases. One of the the prion protein, which is a misfolded normal mm-hmm. protein, actually causes retraction of of the dendritic spines. Mm-hmm. So that, that's thought to be at least in culture. So. Maybe that's what's happening also because that causes uh, – in, those cause incredible loss of uh, neuronal function and, and death always, right, because it just doesn't work anymore. So these are these are interesting because there's some viruses that travel through nerves and they have to cross the synapse. Uh-huh. Right. So they bud from one end and then they immediately fuse uh-huh. with the pre-post-synaptic side. depends which way it's going. They can actually go both ways, pre-post and post-pre. And then they enter, and they keep traveling till they get to the cell body. <laughs> yeah, it's really remarkable. Yeah, and and you know, actually, we we use you know, for example, rabies virus right. uh, for tracing the specific connections because uh, we know that the rabies virus only jumps uh, one synapse. Um, but the thing is, that we don't know exactly why or how. What you know, what what makes the virus sort of synaptic. Uh, it's it's really kind of a mystery. So I thought they were they were actually engineered to do a one synapse. Yeah, job, yeah, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen some remarkable recent papers where they do this incredible engineering to just make it go one <laughs> synapse. I, I'm just amazed at the amount of neuroscience driven virology that exists. And just to emphasize that, I was down at the brain. Uh, Body. What is the name of your place? The mind brain behavior. Mind brain behavior building. I'm waiting for the elevator, and there's this big uh, screen flashing up different things. And one of them, visit our virology core for your vectors. You know, <laughs> they make it for you. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's incredible because it's a fundamental 
thing that everyone... Do you use viral vectors? I guess so. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And almost m- many people use viral vectors to deliver molecular tools or to trace right. circuits do back guys, and forth. And yeah, Do you pack your own virus? We don't. We use the virology ah, core. Yeah, core. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but every, I, yeah. I would say most people get viruses from the core. Yeah. It's ama- I mean, here we can't we don't do that because everyone makes their own virus for different purposes but if you have a standard thing you need for certain experiments it makes perfect sense mm-hmm. it's like having an autoclave room right everyone uses the autoclave because you don't want your own autoclave oh. i just find it amazing and the, there used to be a person heading the core down there and she always used to email me when she had questions about this or that virus right i i and papers i always like to look at the last sentence to see what they say so here is the last sentence of this paper. They say, by coupling synaptic potentiation with membrane remodeling, LTP-induced transport from recycling endosomes to the plasma membrane provides an appealing unifying mechanism for activity-dependent synapse modification. So that last clause, unifying mechanism for activity-dependent synapse modification. Can you kind of unpack that? Why does this provide that? Sure. So I think that, well, I think that the first part is saying that the mechanism for this being, so the molecular basis for this mechanism of activity-dependent synapse modification is taking a membrane trafficking of, or trafficking of AMPA receptors, for example, Mm -hmm. which would be sensitive to um, second messengers that are important to signal plasticity. So for example, intracellular calcium levels. And actually providing the then new receptors onto the surface that can then change the strength. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. One more question. Uh, there. So these two receptors we've mentioned today, the AMPA and the NMDA, what drugs target those? Do you know? Does anyone know? Or, yeah. or are they? Right. Um, well, there's, there's, uh, there's quite a few. So the NMDA receptors, in fact, are... Uh, a target for many drugs that vary from so ketamine, for example, which is a uh, anesthetic, mm-hmm. uh, is thought mm-hmm. to mainly act through NMDA receptors. Um, and in fact, you, the, there's drugs of abuse. So um, angel dust, fencyclidine, is an as an NMDA receptor agonist. Um, mm-hmm. There are some NMDA receptor antagonists. So memantine is a drug is one of the few drugs used in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and some of the anticonvulsant uh, uh, drugs for for epilepsy also target uh, the NMDA receptor. Okay, so, so it's a very important um, drug target for almost any neurological um, disorder. I, and I presume people continue to mine it for more drugs, right? Yep. Oh, and yeah. there's and there's yep. many more subtypes of these receptors. So yeah. there's a uh, Receptor one and two, and there's several classes. It. It's not the only two, but these are the two major classes. Yeah. And AMPA, no, I didn't hear any drugs for AMPA. Yeah. So there's, um, and I think partly that's because the AMPA receptors are so key for just normal brain function, and so yeah. it's very hard to um, modulate something that can affect almost every every synapse in the in the brain. Um, there are some. So there was an. Uh, some drugs that targeted the amperceptors called ampokines that were thought to maybe be used as a cognitive enhancer. Um, I don't actually know what happened to those drugs. Uh, and I think actually Kandel Kend- was involved in some of that. But as far as I know, there's not a lot of uh, drugs on the market that actually specifically target the amperceptors. Mm. Okay. But that's why understanding kind of the mechanisms of amperceptor trafficking or plasticity could give you other drug targets that don't aren't acting as a hammer, right? In sure. Right. Sense, yeah, sure. exactly. Cool. All right. I, I've learned a lot. I hope our listeners have learned also. <laughs> uh-huh. And we'll continue to learn about synapses, I presume. Yes. And many other oh, things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Many <laughs> For other sure. I have, to, I have to remind that Jason on Twitter is Jason Synaptic, right? So <laughs> <laughs> That's very <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have two, we got two emails already, and I wanted to read them. They're pretty short. The first one, our first email comes from Caitlin, and she writes, Dear Evil Twins. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take that before someone else did. First time listener, long time writer here, depending on whether you count other Twecasts. Yeah, Caitlin writes to Twip and Twiv. 
I squealed with joy when I saw the announcement of this podcast, eagerly awaiting the next one. I have long had wistful dreams of Vincent and one of his dream teams laying the unholy smackdown on gender essentialist nonsense, which uses neuroscience as a fig leaf. In fact, that is one of my coping strategies. Whenever I see garbage science articles, I calm down by imagining them getting shredded on Twix. Is there any chance of my dream coming true in the future of twin? If it does not, I will continue to write in with progressively worse puns until you comply. <laughs> Just kidding. It's your show. Caitlin in Seattle. So can can you explain what uh, anyone explain what she means by this gender essentialist nonsense? I have, you know, I don't, I don't really know what she means. No. She may have to explain that. We we'll have to look it up. <laughs> Using neuroscience as a fig leaf for so. It, Send us another email, Caitlin, and we can talk about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's the sort of pseudoscience that, or maybe not pseudoscience, but there's you know debate of um, whether female brains are different to male brains, and, mm. and at sort of the fundamental level, and that. Ah, uh, yes, I bet that's what it is. Yeah, that's um, what I, and so then, of course, whatever side you want to take on specific behaviors, you can use. I'm sure people, you know, Perry cherry pick their neuroscience of um, interest to support it. Mm -hmm. Well, you you mentioned it briefly, Jason, at the beginning, right? Right. So people think something is different. I, I don't even remember transmission or, or synaptic plasticity or yeah, pruning. maturation, maturation, so right? Element that that um, there's some evidence that that uh, in females it takes uh, that that their their brains um, uh, t take or they're quicker to to mature, basically. But you know, this is a very I, it's a, I would say it's it's not a, a well studied um, area. Well, Caitlin, if you have something specific, we can debunk it, right? Or the everyone else, not me, but <laughs> that's what we're here for. Send it in; we'd be happy to do it. And then Yuki writes, "Hello, everyone. I am a big fan of Immune and Professor Racaniello's virology lectures. Now I am so excited because Twin was started." I'm very interested in learning the brain since my mom is with Parkinson's disease. Looking forward to the next episode already. By the way, I love the twin logo, the brain wearing a headphone. Any plan to provide twin products also on the online store? You bet. Uh, Cafepress.com slash twiv. That's because it was started uh, with twiv. And I will put some twin uh, merch there. We got T-shirts, we got mugs, we got water bottles, we got everything. So I will put Twin up because it's a cool um, logo for sure. And I'm it sure it is. I'm sure. I, I was going to say I, I want I want I want some swag. You bet. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, the host will get pay swag. for it. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll get you all swag. But um, a Parkinson's, I'm sure, we'll touch at some point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. plenty of literature on that. So uh, that's great. Thanks for the first two emails for Twin. Caitlin, you win. Uh, I don't know what you win, but <laughs> we'll think of something. And um, if you want to send us email, m twin, at T-W-I-N, at microbe.tv will work. And um, actually, I thought there was another email. Maybe I didn't put, let, let me just look, um, who complained that the email didn't work because I hadn't set it up initially because I didn't think anyone would write for a couple of weeks. You can find us at microbe.tv slash twin, which is where we'll have our show notes. But, of course, most of you will listen on a uh, podcast player, on a phone or or a tablet, and uh, you can just search for twin. I don't know if there's anything else that will come up or this week in neuroscience. And subscribe. That would be great. It's free. You get every episode as we release them, about one a month. And that way we know how many people are listening. And as I said at the top, if you go to microbe.tv slash contribute, there are a couple of ways you can help us out. There you will find a link to the uh, store where you can buy things. But uh, in those, we don't make, we make a dollar per item. So we don't make a lot on that, but it's mostly so that you can wear stuff with our logo on it. And then people will say, what's that? And you can tell them. <laughs> You could spread by the word. But um, you can also use Patreon or PayPal to give us a little bit of money each month. You know, a dollar would be great, uh, which for you is, you can't even get a subway ride here in New York City anymore. But uh, if you send it to us, you get 
to help us with our podcast. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Today on Twim has Twin. Someone warned me that Twin is too close to Twim, and I just <laughs> made the first uh, blunder. <laughs> twin. Ori Lieberman on Twitter is Ori Lieberman. Thanks, Ori. Thank you for having us, Vincent. No, it's your podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm just asking the questions. You're in the driver's seat. I hope yeah. you like the uh, questions. I'm just no, they're great. curious, they're, they're um, yeah. and I will keep it up. Jason Shepard's at Jason Synaptic. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. I hope you like talking about synapses. Uh, well, you know, I've de- <laughs> dedicated my whole career to synapses. Yeah, that's right, that's joking. <laughs> if I didn't like it, I'm in the, in the wrong profession for sure. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get more opportunities here to talk about them. Andres Bendeski is on Twitter at Bendeski. Thanks and welcome, Andres. Yeah, great to be here. Hope you see. Hope we see you uh, more in in the in person. It's nice to have uh, you two guys here, right? Yeah. Um, and the sound is better. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. We missed Erin today, but she'll be back, right? Yep. She's on study section. Mm-hmm. She has a good excuse, right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. We thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.